Okay, we continue the story, the exciting story and true story of uh, Paul's journey, uh, actually starting from Jerusalem all the way intended uh, de uh, destination, Rome. Uh, but yesterday we read a bit about it and you would recall uh, Paul was uh, two years in Caesarea waiting for Festus to make a decision, waffling to and fro. And finally, okay, decided he will appear before uh, Caesar. So they went on to Sidon and started the sea journey. The idea was to hug the coast as much as possible and then to avoid uh, the storms. Huh? Because uh, it was already uh, almost winter and not a good time to sail in the Mediterranean. Okay, from Sidon. Uh, they went past Cyprus, and then to Myra, and on to Rhodes, and then to Crete. You remember a place called Fair Havens, not Heavens, uh, Fair Havens. And the plan was to winter in Phoenix. That means you stop your journey, you go to a good harbor, not just uh, meteorologically uh, safe, but also with good supplies, and also a good place where you can catch an onward ship or the same ship. But you very often they had to winter uh, in a good harbor. And the plan was to go to Phoenix. But it was not to be as they left Fair Havens, they were blown off course. And instead, going towards the north coast of Africa, instead of going uh, westwards or in north west towards Rome. So it is at here, Acts 27, verse 27 onwards. Today, we will read a blow-by-blow -blow account of how the storm progressed and what happened. Today, we are not going to read verse by verse, but I would recommend you take out your Bible and uh, turn to Acts 27, verse 27, and follow along on whatever version you have. We are going to play three videos today. One will be an uh, animated production of uh, what actually happened during the storm, during the journey, and on to Malta. And then we will show another uh, short video. In uh, not, it will show a 3D map. In short, a drone eye view of the journey, and you get to see. Uh, from the top down, how the islands or the seas were. And finally, something very uh, close to today's uh, time, we will show you a very recent documentary by CBN that tells not so much to dispute where the traditional site of where they landed in Malta, but rather the bigger picture is God's word is true, right down to the very last detail. Uh, so get your Bibles out, turn to Acts 27, verse 27. And we will set sail with Paul. Bear in mind, uh, there are actually more than four groups of people on board. First, we have the soldiers, and uh, of course, uh, the centurion Julius. And then we have the prisoners. Paul, Aristarchus, Luke, uh, on their way to Rome. Some were like Paul, waiting uh, a hearing, while others were being sent to be to meet with the gladiators or to be thrown uh, in the uh, stadium with animals for the sport of the Romans. And then we have also the sailors, and we also have the owner and the pilot. Uh, interesting to know that in theory, the hierarchy of the whole journey is Julius the centurion is actually the captain and the one in charge. But in each decision he makes, he consults a few people and the pilot together with the owner uh, was often consulted, all right? So here we see uh, it was not an ordinary storm, but a very, very bad uh, storm. Uh. And a quick recap. Yesterday, you remember, Pastor Andrew, what storms cannot 
do. Uh, all of us, at some point or another, are subject to the storms of life, the trials of life. But our great assurance from the Word of God and from experience, many of us, we know storms, number one, cannot hinder the purpose of God. It is good for us to understand what is God's purpose for us, an immediate purpose, a long-term purpose. Number two, storms cannot hide the face of God, the very presence of God. The Quran Dio of God, you remember? Once we acknowledge that God is with us no matter what, that would be a great help for us on what to do during the storms of life. And finally, the great assurance that storms cannot harm the people of God. So here, a very quick recap huh, from Sidon to Myra, down to Crete, Fair Havens, trying to go to Phoenix, but blown off course, and the storm, and finally, in Malta, three months they were there, and then at the end of today's reading, Acts 28, 10, to go to Syracuse in Sicily, and there on to Regia, Puteoli, and onwards towards Rome, overland, and where Paul was met, Paul and uh, his company, was met by the believers in Rome. A very exciting time that they actually left Rome to meet them halfway. So Paul and the rest stayed in Malta for three months. Uh, and you can bet they were not idle, busy, blessing mm. others and sharing the gospel. Now let's take a quick uh, drone's eye view of the whole journey. Snidus, where it turned southward towards the island of Crete in Acts 27, 3-7. They passed Cape Salmoni, or Sideros, and then on to Lasea, on the island of Crete, near the city of Fairhaven, where they spent much time in Acts 27, 7-13. After a difficult journey, the ship anchors at the Cretan city of Fairhaven, Although Paul warns Julius not to sail the Mediterranean during this dangerous time of the year, September to October, the centurion disregards his advice and has the ship set sail for the western part of the island and the harbor of Phoenix in Acts 27, 9 through 12. But en route, the ship encounters a fierce storm which drives it out to sea. The storm forces them to lose control, blowing them past the island of Clauda or Gavdos, but no way to stop. The strong winds and overcast skies which hide the sun and moon cause the ship to lose all control and disorientation and throwing things overboard to, to not go down in the sea, they aimlessly tossed about in the sea for about two weeks from Acts 27, 13 to 27. Finally, in the fall of 60 AD, eventually the ship drifts near the island of Malta where it is run aground. All 276 people on board ship abandon ship. They grab whatever parts of the floating wreckage they can and make their way to the island. Acts 27, 37 to 44. All those on the ship arrive safely in Malta, fulfilling God's promise that no life would be lost. In Acts 27, 22 to 25. Paul stays three months on Malta, where he is treated kindly by the natives. And in his short stay on the island, he miraculously survives a bite from a poisonous snake, heals the father of the island's governor, and many others in Acts 28, 1-10. He then boards a ship wintering at the island and sets sail for Syracuse on the island of Sicily. Okay, uh, just a quick explanation. Uh, when we say the leeward side, uh, if the wind is blowing this way and there's a Mountain to block much of the wind. This side is called the leeward side. Nah? And that's where they try always to be on the leeward side so that they won't get the strong winds. Nah? So uh, a port might be nearer, but uh, too strong to go in a straight line. They choose leeward side. Okay. And then another point of interest yesterday we were reading up uh, and we read uh, the early part of verse, uh, chapter 27. They threw ropes over and tried to tie the ship together so that the wooden parts of the ship uh, will not break. And we were saying, how did they possibly put ropes over and under the ship? Uh, we did a quick research and found out 
usually at the bow of the uh, ship, the front of the ship, or from the back. In this case, we see the front of the ship, two groups of sailors, one on each side of the bow will lower and make a loop over. And then as they move towards the end of the ship, they keep lowering the rope and until they reach this position. And then they bring the two ends together and secure uh, and fasten and lash together the ropes to prevent any breakages of the hull, especially. Uh, and this is repeated a few times just to explain that uh, what is in the Bible is possible. Uh. Okay, now we will watch uh, a, a CBN documentary to show not so much to challenge the traditional site of St. Paul's Bay, but to show credibility on how accurate the Bible is. Uh. It was sometime around 60 AD and the Apostle Paul was en route to Rome from the Isle of Crete. On the journey, a fierce storm blew the ship off course. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea, when about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were approaching land. They took soundings and found the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea. With the storm still raging, the ship struck a sandbar and began to break apart. The nearly 300 men on board swam for their lives. Miraculously, everyone survived. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. And so began a Christian influence in Malta that has continued down through the centuries. Today, Malta is Europe's most religious nation. 98% of its citizens are Catholic. St. Paul is memorialized across the island, nowhere more than in St. Paul's Bay, where tourists come to visit the shipwreck cathedral and see the spot where most believe Paul's ship ran aground nearly 2,000 years ago. But when former Los Angeles crime scene investigator Bob Cornu paid a visit to Malta, facts in the biblical narrative didn't fit with the view from St. Paul's Bay. That difference led to a 10-year search for the true location of Paul's shipwreck. Bob started in the pages of his Bible. The crux of the story revolved around the four anchors. Could they be found? And I looked at the Bible and said, could I solve this like it was a crime? Could I take the evidence that exists on the pages of the Bible and actually find these lost anchors that the Bible talks about? Acts 27 and 28 gives a very detailed account, so Bob listed four factors that would have to match up in order to find the true location. A bay with a beach, a reef with a sandbar where two seas meet, the seabed at about 90 feet of depth, and a place the sailors would not have recognized. Cornuke enlisted the help of a group of men who know the waters around Malta best, the Maltese fishermen. So what I did is I started my search by going out with these fishermen that knew the weather, knew the currents, knew the topography of the ocean. They took me out with them and they explained to me all the possible places based on what the Bible narrative says to where the shipwreck of Paul could have been. Most of Malta is surrounded by cliffs, so Bob quickly narrowed down the possibilities to a few bays with beaches. To figure out which site was most plausible, Cornuke looked to Dr. Graham Hutt an expert on Mediterranean storms. I've been studying the storms and the weather patterns in the Mediterranean over the past 30 years. Um, and uh, it resulted in a book on North Africa and Malta, which covers all these uh, issues with the weather. Dr. Hutt's expertise helped make sense of the clues in Acts. They were really scared of getting dragged down into the Bay of Sirte, uh, down on the Libyan coast. So they would have been trying as much as they could to head in a northerly direction, but only actually making northwesterly. The only bay in that area that fits the direction of drift Bob calculated is called the Bay of St. Thomas. 
In my opinion, bearing in mind where they most probably would have been, St. Thomas's Bay is a much more likely place. We're just coming into St. Thomas Bay on the southeastern side of Malta, and the theory goes that this was the bay that was written about in Acts 27 and 28. Now, part of the biblical account says that the sailors didn't recognize the island and didn't know where they were until the villagers told them that this was Malta. And that is another support for the theory that this was the bay that they landed in because if the sailors had landed on the north side of the island, there were many ports that they should have been familiar with. One day, Bob made an electrifying discovery. It came by way of an old diver with an incredible story. I met a man named Ray Chancho and he said, hey Bob, in the late 60s and early 70s, we dug up four anchors from the ocean bottom at about 90 feet depth. The location, just outside St. Thomas Bay, near a dangerous sandbar called the Moonshar Reef. The anchors were later donated to the National Maritime Museum. An expert analysis confirmed that they were from the Roman era, but the divers had no idea what they had at the time. We found the anchors uh, at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. I wouldn't remember the exact year, you know. As I say, it was of no importance to me whatsoever when we found them. It was, yippee, we found a piece of lead. Ray agreed to show us the area where the anchors were found. Coming out to the head of Muntar Reef. Dive down and see if we can find the site where the anchors were brought up. So when I went out and looked at the location where they found these anchors, I looked at the shoreline and it fit with what the Bible said. There was a bay with a beach. There was a reef where two seas come together. Today, the seafloor is again tranquil and calm, giving no clues to the secrets that lie beneath the waves. It's impossible to know for sure if this is the spot where Paul's shipwreck occurred. But many Maltese are intrigued by the theory. Joe Navarro is another of the divers who helped retrieve the anchors. I myself am convinced that it is more plausible that the shipwreck was on Munchar, not on St. Paul's Island. We have believed St. Paul's Island, but nobody ever sort of questioned, but are you sure? We looked down at this glistening anchor and I remember kneeling down and putting my hand on that cold object and thinking that I could be now touching history. For 2,000 years it belonged to the sea and now I was actually touching this object that could come to us from the pages of the Bible. Today, the anchors are tucked away in a corner of Valletta's Maritime Museum. Most visitors pass them by having no idea what history they might hold. Chuck Holton, CBN News. Okay, here we see uh, uh, the location of St. Thomas Bay as against the traditional site of St. Paul's Bay. Uh. Here is to give you an idea of the scale uh, of how large the anchors were, you know. Uh, uh, Pope Benedict visited uh, Malta uh, and here you see He's talking to some of the people and the anchor is right there before him. So we want to draw some lessons from these four anchors. Uh, you see, the first anchor we need to give the storms of life is to know that the presence of God is real and available to us. The second anchor we need is to know what is God's purpose for us. And Paul knew very well, in spite of the storms and all the things going on, he knew. He had a vision. He had to go to Rome. All will be safe. He knew his purpose. So he wasn't very distracted at all by the storms. And he knew God was with him. And his faith, of course, is exemplary. And all on board the ship saw that. And finally, he had that one hope. That hope kept him focused. Huh? And so I trust these four anchors will also be real to us and be precious to us, even as we go through various storms, especially during this season, a time 